once again a very good afternoon to everyone and um i see canon simmons charlie and elena and christian good to see you all It's been too long, Father. Too long. <laughs> How long? <laughs> Not long, right? <laughs> How long is too long between friends? <laughs> well, when compared to eternity, I guess it's not that long, is it? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I'm sitting at your feet this evening. <laughs> well, I told I told uh, Coach Wright that I, I was hoping to sit at his feet, uh, so... <laughs> Um, we are all at each other's feet. <laughs> okay, do have a pleasant evening. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Okay. My brother Charlie. <laughs> My brother. <laughs> <laughs> And Christian, how are you, sir? Hi, Brother Dennison. It is good to see you again. Good to and see to you hear your again. voice. Yes. As Elena said, a long time, right? Too long. Quite a long time. It's yes. probably even longer for me than it is for her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because I, I, if I recall it correctly, the last time I saw you would have been Synod in Grenada. No, no, no. When you all came up, remember you all came up um, sometime back to get prepared for Eleanor's ordination? I think that was the last time. No, no there was Synod in Grenada since then. Oh, it was there. Is that 2016? Okay, all right. That's so it's that amazing. That was the time. very last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh. tell you. Well, uh, my apologies. I, I guess you're right now. Yeah. That's okay, my friend. That's Dad, okay. Otis? <laughs> Otis? Hey, Dennison. How are you, sir? I am well, thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, okay. take it easy. All right. How is she? She's doing pretty well. Yeah, she's doing very well, thanks. Uh, okay, good, good. Thanks for asking. Right. And the family's well? Yeah, they are. All right. Greeting, Charlie. Yeah, your mic is off. Yeah, hi, Otis. Yeah, I, 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 I recognize the name when Dennison called it, <laughs> but I can't see I can't see your face. After all these years, it is it's, it's wonderful to hear your voice and, and to see your face. Blessings. All right, Charlie. They're good. Blessings. Good to you. see you, Dean Nichols. Cheryl Phelps, can you? How are you? How are you? Yes, yes. Charlie, this is Conrad yeah. Davis. You still owe me a call from two years ago. <laughs> I, I apologize. I apologize. So how much longer shall I wait for that call? <laughs> <laughs> the pandemic is sidetracked as soon as we, we come back from the pandemic. When is that? That's never. No, no, we're coming back. We, when? I think I think we're on the road to recovery. Uh, the, 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 the governor has opened up the state. Uh, yesterday, and uh, and I think that paves the way for the church to open. So you know, yeah. uh, I've been working from home, so I'm I'm pretty much uh, powerless uh, these these days. All right. Um, 
Bishop is 704. Um, any instructions with regard to the time? Bishop, your mic is muted. All right. Um, we are about to start the program. The Archbishop Memorial Lecture for 2021 and at this point in time i'd like to introduce to you introduce you to the mc for the night her name is zoe shell henry a member of the anglican church women association and also she is a member of the anglican youth movement so without much ado I'd just like to introduce you to Zoisha Henry, who will now MC the proceedings for tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Alin, and a pleasant evening and heartfelt welcome to each and everyone viewing this virtual event as we host the seventh annual Archbishop of the Most Reverend Sir George Cuthbert Woodruff Memorial Lecture on the occasion of the, 20, the 57th anniversary of Bishop's College Kingston. We are delighted to be here. I am happy to have every member with us this evening viewing this live virtually. As Mr. Ali mentioned, my name is Zoisha Henry and I am a member of the St. George's Cathedral, St. Vincent, where I attend regular service at the Daughter Church at the Church of the Transfiguration. Romans 8, 28 reminds us that all things work together for good to those who love God. And despite it all, despite everything that has been going on within the world, we are grateful and we are thankful to God that through his gift of technological advancements and innovations, we are able to conduct this virtual session this evening. I pray that it would be warming to our hearts and that we delight in the fact that we are able to meet, to fellowship, and most importantly, to carry out the work of God. I would like to announce the presence of our bishop, the Right Reverend C. Leopold Friday, Bishop of the Windward Islands. We also have in our midst a very special guest, the Reverend Dr. Denison Richards. He is St. Lucian and is presently the rector of the Church of St. James in Queens, New York, within the Diocese of Long Island, USA. And Dr. Richards will speak to us this evening on the topic, being a church of hope in a grieving world through the eyes of a pioneer, preacher, and pastor. I trust that at the end of of this evening's proceedings that we will be filled with God's good message to go forth. I also want to recognize the presence of some ministers of God's word that I would have recognized. The Reverend Father Jones, Venerable Michael Marshall, Venerable Christian Glasgow, Reverend Eleanor Glasgow, Father Week, and all the other ministers who have joined us here today. I also want to give a special welcome to God's people. I'm happy to have you, and I'm thrilled that we are nevertheless able to congregate, virtually as it may be, but we give God thanks. At this current time, I would ask the Venerable Michael Marshall to open us with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, 
We come before you with grateful hearts this evening. For you are a mighty God. We glorify you for your loving kindness, your faithfulness, and the mm -hmm. countless ways you have blessed us. We thank you for the opportunity to meet for this seventh annual memorial lecture and the interest shown by those who are gathered virtually to participate. We ask your continued blessings and guidance upon the planning committee of this event. May all the effort bear fruit in due season as they seek to strengthen our church community. And even as we come to this lecture, dear God, we give you thanks for the life, work, and witness of our beloved Archbishop, the Most Reverend Sir George Cuthbert Manning Woodruff, whose blessed memory we commemorate in this lecture. We ask you, Lord, that you grant him a place of solace, peaceful rest and glorious life everlasting in your heavenly kingdom. We also pause, dear Father, and we pray and recognize the contribution of Bishop's College Kingston to education, the shaping of young minds for these past 57 years. We give thanks to the founding father, all those who would have passed through the hallowed walls of this institution, and this institution are now filled with knowledge and wisdom. Oh God, the fountain of wisdom and knowledge. Extend your divine wisdom to our lecturer, Reverend Father Dennison Richards, so that he would be able to impart effectively his God-given knowledge to all of us. May your Holy Spirit inspire him and grant him a spirit of courage, clarity, and boldness in his delivery this evening. Grant us receptive hearts, deepen our comprehension, broaden our thinking, and transform our understanding of what we are about to learn. Let the birds fall on fertile soil and take root in us this evening. Lord, we are living in a broken world. There is much grief, pain, suffering, and hardship everywhere. Therefore, may we be living witnesses of your genuine love through the implementation of the knowledge acquired through this activity. Anoint our creativity, our ideas, our energy, so that even the smallest thoughts may bring you honor and renew a sense of hope, life, joy to all the encounter in this world. Father God, I commit this lecture into your hands and pray that everything will go in accordance with your mm -hmm. divine will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Marshall, for that deep and inspiring prayer. And before we proceed, I would just like to inform each and every one that um, when someone is currently speaking or praying or giving that lecture, that you have your mics muted so that there is little to no interference and we were able to flow very smoothly this evening. Thank you. As we proceed, I would like to give special mention to the principal of Bishop's College, Kingston, Miss Cecilia Akers King. Thank you for joining us, Miss King. And I would also like to make mention of our deputy principal, Mr. Rosman Richardson. Thank you so much for being here with us. We will now have the national anthem rendered by a student of Bishop's College, Kingston. <coughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Hello everyone, I do apologize for that glitch. I do apologize. Nevertheless, as we mentioned, all things work together for good through those who love God, to those who trust God, and we are going to proceed. We believe that our students would have also received We have been some challenges in wireless. But I'll go ahead with it with my signal. some internet problem with dropping so I'll go ahead with the welcome. I take this opportunity to welcome you to the seventh annual Bishop Most Event Sir George for the final just memorial lecture entitled Be in the Church of Hope in a Grieving World. As Bishop Woodruff was the first indigenous bishop of the Diocese of the Willard Islands and also Archbishop of the Church in the province of the West Indies. And we are linking this to Bishop Scully because he also played an important role and a great interest in Bishop Scully's Kingston. These lectures started in 2014. The first lecture was entitled The Relevance of Anglicanism in the Contemporary Caribbean. And it was delivered by the most servant doctor, the Honorable Dr. John W. D. Holder, 
Because the Bishop of Barbados and asked me to church and prophet to West Indies at that time. It was followed in 2015 with the topic, The Role of the Anglican Church in the Emerging Caribbean Civilization, by the Reverend Canonizer uh, Philip of the Diocese of the Northeastern Caribbean in Aruba. 2016, the topic was Revisiting Word and Way, Communicating Crisis to a Contemporary Caribbean Audience. And this was presented by Mr. Rudon A. Eversley, a member of the St. Christopher Anglican Church, Diocese of Barbados. In 2017, the topic was In Search of a New Theological Discourse in the Caribbean. And this was delivered by the Right Reverend Dr. Robert Thompson, Suffragan Bishop, Kingston Diocese of Jamaica. In 2018, the topic was Anglican Worship and Sacramentality in the Contemporary Caribbean. And this was delivered by the Urban Canon Noel Burke of the Diocese of Barbados. In 2019, the topic was the Church at Crossroads Jews in the Critical Path. And this was delivered by Ms. Unika Morgan, a member of the Cathedral Parish, St. George in Kingston, St. Vincent. So today we have the seventh annual uh, this, the most open Sir George Cuthbert Manning Woodrow's memorial lecture. And last year, 2020, uh, we were still in the early stages and responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we didn't have a lecture last year. But this year we have in the first virtual lecture at this time. So we are grateful that for this technology and that we are able to do so. So I welcome you to this seventh annual Archbishop to most of them, Sir George Cuthbert Manning Rubble Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop. I am certain that we feel very welcomed by you this evening. And we move into our program by inviting the Reverend Father C. Jones to conduct the profile of Archbishop Woodruff as we commemorate our daily departed Archbishop. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, my Lord Bishop and Dr. Richards and all the listening audience. His Grace the Most Reverend Sir George Cuthbert Manning Woodruff, the sixth Bishop of the Diocese of the Virgin Islands, and as Bishop of the Church in the province of the West Indies, was born on the 17th of May 1918 to George and Eben Woodruff of Belmont, St. George Grenada was baptized and confirmed at the St. George's Anglican Church, Church Street, St. George's Grenada. His primary education was at the St. George's Anglican Junior and Second and Senior Schools, Church Street, St. George's, commonly called or referred to as J.K. School, after the principal, Mr. Jacobs. His secondary education was at the Grenada Boys Secondary School, GBSS. After completing his secondary education, he was employed as a customs officer at Her Majesty's Customs, St. George's. During this time, he also played in the Harmony Kings Orchestra and was for some time organist at St. George's Parish Church, Grenada. Abel Fodou entered Cotton College, Barbados, in the early part of the 1940s to test his vocation to the sacred ministry of the church. In those days, the college was affiliated to the University of Durham, England. On completion of his theological studies, 
He was ordained at St. George's Cathedral, Kingston, St. Vincent and Grenadines, as a deacon on 4th April 1944, as the Sacred Order Priest on 12th February 1945, that they being show Tuesday, Carnival Day, Mardi Gras. And one could imagine the feeling at that time as Bishop Woodruff stuff was going on, there was Carnival outside. One could understand what was going on then. After his ordination, he served at St. George's Cathedral, Kingston, for a short period. Then he migrated to Barbados in the other part of the 1940s, where he served in the following positions. Vicar of St. Simon's Church, Rector of St. Andrew's Parish Church, Rector of St. Joseph's Church, and Rector of St. John's Parish Church. During his time in Barbados, he was also a master at Lord School in St. John's. In 1967, he was invited by the then Bishop of the Diocese of the Rhode Islands, the Right Reverend Harold Grant Pigott, to return to his home diocese I was appointed rector and sub-dean of St. George's Cathedral, Kingstown, thus becoming the first local and black bishop of the diocese, of, of the diocese, he being a Grenadian, and was consecrated a bishop of the Church of God on September 29, 1969, the Feast of St. Michael on All Angels. It was an historic and momentous occasion. He served in this position until 1986. He was also the first local and black archbishop of the church in the province. Been elected in 1980 by the House of Bishops in succession to His Grace, the Most Reverend Dr. Alan John Knight, an Englishman was also Bishop of the Diocese of Guyana. Archbishop Bishop Woodruff retired from the church's active ministry in 1986. Archbishop Bishop Woodruff was a man of deep devotion and prayer. He recited the Anglican Office of Morning and Evening Prayer and the Roman Breviary. People traveled from different parishes to listen to his inspiring, thought-provoking, and enlightening sermons, for he was known as an excellent preacher, communicator, and teacher. As bishop of our diocese, he saw his clergy as his own sons. I must say in those days there were only male clergy, so he saw us as his own sons. Indeed, he often referred to me as my son and sought to relate to them not only as a father in God, but as a father. He was one who always sought to resolve matters in a calm and peaceful way and suffered fools gladly. Above all, uh, Bishop Woodruff was a man of great humor and humility he never forgot his humble beginnings. He welcomed and embraced all. Those who sat on thrones and those who had nowhere to lay their head. Although he became Archbishop of the Church in this our province, he was ever conscious of his humanness, his mortality, and his dependence on Almighty God. He was a man of great diligence and care. Our present bishop, the Right Reverend C. Leopold Friday, the ninth bishop of our beloved diocese, was the last of the many priests whom he fathered, mentored, encouraged, at for training, and ordained. 
I mentioned Bishop Friday was the last of Bishop Woodruff's ordinance. I was among the priests who joined the bishop in laying on of hands at his ordination. For that beautiful service, as a new priest, Father, Father Friday, presented himself to bless those who came and knelt before him for his first priestly blessing. His father, if I remember very well, was among the first two or three to come to him for his blessing. As Bishop Woodruff, with that voice, that voice of love, here, that family voice, it is as if I'm hearing him even now. He said, Leopold, bless your father. It was a beauty to behold as father knelt before son to receive his blessing. And the newly ordained priest, the Reverend Father C. Leopold Friday, blessed his father, the Reverend Deacon Calvert Friday, Sr. This has ever been etched on my memory. Abbe Woodruff was indeed my hero. Indeed, my last son bears his name Cuthbert. He was a wise man, a holy man. And I dare say, he sinned. He died on November 29th in the year 2012 and was interred in the cathedral churchyard following the funeral Eucharist on 5th December 2012. To his two children, Andrew and Paula, please know that this diocese will be eternally grateful to Almighty God for the service and ministry of your father. With great affection, we also remember Lady Woodruff, who accompanied him on all his missionary journeys. I was a great town strength to him. I want to express my sincere thanks to the Lord Bishop by inviting me to do this presentation, which I regard as an honor, a pleasure, and privilege. May His Grace, the Most Reverend Sir George Cabot Manning Woodruff, Knight Commander of the British Empire, Master of Arts, Doctor of Divinity, and Lady Woodruff, for doing the rest in peace. Rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord, and to them, O Lord, that his shall shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Jones, for such depth in commemorating the life of our dear Archbishop Woodruff. What stood out to me most is the perseverance and persistence that Archbishop had. And I find it so fitting as we commemorate his life and we honor Bishop's College Kingston in celebrating its 57th anniversary. And immediately what comes to mind is the fact that we have come very far by faith. And as we venture further with God's grace, we will reach greater heights. And so I want to thank you for that history. It's inspiring. And I know it's not only going to be enriching for me as a young person, but for the other persons who are not familiar with his life and work and can attest to it to be through your words. Thank you so very much, Father Jones. At this time, I ask Mr. Rosman Richardson to present his remarks. Mr. Richardson is the Deputy Principal of Bishop's College. Yes, good evening, everyone. Bishops College Kingston always deems it a pleasure to be a part of the annual Archbishop, the Most Reverend Sir, Cut, Sir George Cuthbert Manning Woodrow Memorial Lecture. 
The church has always played a major role in the academic and spiritual development of our students. We appreciate the dedication and commitment shown throughout the year. And this lecture exemplifies the symbiotic relationship between the church and the school. Archbishop Woodrow was very passionate about education and has shown great interest in ensuring that the school was equipped with what was necessary to keep it functioning and for its sustainability. This year, 2021, has been one of great challenge for us at the school and indeed at all schools throughout in the Grandies. Firstly, we have been severely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, which saw us moving from face-to-face -face school to online schooling. And here at Bishop's College, it was done almost seamlessly. And just as we were called the 12th, we were impacted by the explosive eruption of the La Sofre volcano on April the 9th. Bishop's College then became a, an evacuation shelter when the evacuation order was given on April the 8th. And we have created a warm and friendly environment where the evacuees felt and feel like they were at home. The students in the shelter had devotions each morning and are engaged in academic and informal activities while the adults utilized the agricultural field and assisted in the kitchen and also they took part in fun activities. This was to give them a sense of normalcy and to ensure that they do not become overwhelmed and depressed. Now, undoubtedly, this constant break in the normal flow of things has indeed put a strain on our CSEC students who will be attempting their exams this year. Bishop's College Kingston has already devised a plan to cater for the needs of the students and to prepare them for the reopening of school. And I must say that Fortunately, we are able, we have been able to have our fifth form students return to school for face-to-face -face class, which will greatly aid them in the preparation for their CSEC exams. Here at Bishop's College, we have kept parents, guardians, and students well informed and up to date on information related to school and their education. We have also assisted and made sure that we took care of our students who were struggling and in need, whether it be financially, physically, emotionally, or mentally. We are proud to be a church school where our passion and love is shown in everything that we do here at the school. This year, the school team is New Day, New Opportunity for Me. It is in this time when our country is being battered and beaten that this theme becomes a beacon of hope for all of us. The students will continue to see the theme as a reminder that no matter how hopeless or impossible the situation may seem, a new day will dawn, bringing with it hope for a new start and new opportunities. The topic tonight, being the church of hope in a grieving world, 
through the eyes of a pioneer, preacher, and pastor is such a timely and appropriate topic for such a time as this. In the midst of all the turmoil here at home and indeed around the world, this topic tonight is one that, that reassures that the church reassures us that there is hope in the world, even as it seems to be headed into a bleak and uncertain future. We count it an honor and a privilege to have the Reverend Dr. Denison S. Richards with us here tonight, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, special welcome to all of you. Thank you all for being here tonight and do have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Richardson. Thank you for that detailed and wonderful deliberation as it pertains to Bishop's College. Bishop's College Kingston is indeed a multifaceted and multi-talented school built on love, strength, faith, and persistence. And I want to thank you for the reminder of that, Rodman. At this time, it is no doubt and it is no surprise that some of Bishop College talent will be showcased on this platform this evening. And so I invite Mr. Ronnie Richardson to greet us with this special item. Good evening, everyone. I trust that we are all having a wonderful evening thus far. And even as I render this song, I want to encourage all of us that whatever we do, always aspire to let those who come behind us find us faithful. <laughs> Pilgrims on the journey of the narrow road, and those who've gone before us light the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary. Their lives are stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run the race, not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly life. Find us, find us faithful, and may the fire of our devotion light their way, and may the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Come behind us, find us faithful. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all we left behind, may the clues that they discover and the memory they uncover, become the light that will lead them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful, and may the fire of our devotion light their way. And 
may the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Obey on who come behind us. to come and so I trust that those who come behind us would find us faithful thanks again Mr. Richardson I now invite the Venerable Christian Glasgow Archdeacon of St. Lucia to introduce our lecturer for tonight the Reverend Dr. Denison Richards Venerable Glasgow Madam Chairperson Thank you. Madam Chairperson, my Lord Bishop, brothers and sisters in Christ, good evening. The journey of our guest speaker certainly qualifies him as the right choice to deliver this seventh memorial lecture of the most Reverend Sir Cuthbert George Manning Woodruff. It also qualifies him to be described as a pioneer preacher and pastor. Our guest speaker hails from the beautiful Caribbean island of the Helen of the West, seven time French seventh time British, St. Lucia. He is the third child of God's gift of four children to Quentin and Amy Richards. Our guest speaker had his early education at that August institution of the Castries Anglican Infant School and later on at the Canon Laurie Anglican Primary School. His secondary education was at the Castries Comprehensive Secondary School. His Christian formation, however, was under the watchful eyes of the Venerable Randolph Evelyn, then Archdeacon of St. Lucia. Our guest speaker was involved in the leadership of the church in a variety of areas. Sunday school teacher, youth leader, the reader, and parishioners of St. Mary the Virgin Lakai will say to you that as a fledgling congregation, this young man, with the assistance of Anne Emmanuel, were the ones who 
held the reign there and nurtured them to be the congregation they are today. Persons who know them so well, family members, close mem friends, describe him as a strong-willed and strong-headed person. Testimony to this is that in 1990, our guest speaker gave up what was, by all standards, a growing and promising career in the civil service, specifically in the Treasury Department. And he gave this up to answer a call to vocation and to go to Coddington College to test that calling. Whilst at Coddington College, during the year 1993, our guest speaker was selected to attend a summer internship in clinical pastoral education, CPE, in New York. Intrigued with clinical pastoral ministry, he returned to Coddington College to complete his Bachelor of Arts degree theology, where he wrote his thesis on the church's response to pastoral care to persons living with HIV and AIDS. After graduating from Coddington College, he was ordained to the diaconate on the feast of the St. Thomas in 1994, and he was priested on the feast of St. Thomas in 1995. Fortunately, he has one patron saint. He was assigned to serve from 1994 to 1998 at St. George's Cathedral, Kingston, St. Mary's Parish, Becre, and St. James Leo with St. Mary's Buckerman in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In 1999, our guest speaker and his wife, Faye, and their daughter, Dine, migrated to the United States of America. And there, he continued his studies in clinical pastoral education with the College of Pastoral Supervision and Psychotherapy. As part of his academic requirements for the completion of that study, he wrote his thesis on the church's response with pastoral care for persons living with Alzheimer's disease. Upon graduating as a board certified pastoral counselor, he was able to secure the position of director of pastoral care at the Bishop Charles Waldo McQueen Episcopal Nursing Home, Far Rockaway, New York. And there, he served from 2000 to 2008. During that period, he also taught at St. Mark's Day School, Brooklyn, New York. In 2008, our guest speaker resigned from the nursing home to answer the call to serve as the eighth rector of the Church of St. James the Rest, Queens, New York. He is still serving there today. Just to say that his educational background includes a Doctor of Divinity degree, 
with Masters in International University of Divinity, Evansville, Indiana, and a degree in Applied Science, Funeral Service Education, Northampton Community College, Pennsylvania, and the International Conference of Funeral Service Examination Board, the ICFSE. No doubt, you must be convinced that our guest speaker is the right choice to deliver this memorial lecture. My Lord Bishop, brothers and sisters, I present to you the Reverend Father, Dr. Denison Sherman Richards. Thank you. Thank you, Archdeacon. Bishop Friday, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, all a very good evening to you. Thanks, Archdeacon, for that introduction. And also thank you, Bishop, for your invitation to be the guest lecturer tonight. Friends, my theme tonight is being the church of hope in the grieving world. Being the church of hope in a grieving world. And I will reflect on the, the life, the witness, and the work of our beloved Archbishop Woodruff as a pioneer preacher and uh, pastor. Thank you, Archdeacon, for making public that I'm a very strong-willed, a strong-headed person. After all, I was the dean of the Feast of St. Thomas. Unless I see the mark of the nails and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand is, I would not believe. Thank you, Mr. Richardson, for reminding us that all who come behind us must find us faithful. Thank you, Archdeacon Marshall, for reminding us that by the grace of God and the Spirit of God, we will receive courage and clarity and boldness in engaging in meaningful ministry wherever God sends us. And thank you, Father Jones, for reminding us of the importance of seeing the call to ministry as a call to a privilege and an honor in serving God and his people. But it's amazing how the spirit works. I thank the master of ceremony, to be politically correct, mistress of ceremony. In quoting Romans 8, which is my favorite passage, my mantra is Kelegundium omnia corporantu in bonum. All things work for good to those who serve the Lord. So thank you all tonight. Let us pray. Lord God, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Grant, O most merciful Father, that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Therefore, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, 
and wisdom to know the difference. I'm going to share my screen now with you as we continue this service. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Friday, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, once again, a very good evening to one and all. The Most Reverend Sir George Cuthbert Manning Woodruff, Knight of the British Empire, a Master of Arts in Theology and a Doctor of Divinity. Born May 17th, 1918, and departed this life on November 29th, 2012. It was the pastoral theologian Stephen Ivey who said that we are each one of us parables. We are each one of us parables. And uh, Sir George Cuthbert Manning Woodruff was a parable, a son born to George and Evelyn Woodruff of Grenada. A parable, a son of the Windward Islands, the parable, a son of uh, the province of uh, the West Indies. Just as interpreting the scriptural parable helps one to come to a deeper spiritual reality of the reign of God in the midst of his people, so too pastoral care helps one to come to a deeper spiritual awareness in the care of another. The life and the work of the late Sir George Cuthbert Manning Woodruff was indeed a great and wonderful parable. An earthly story, as we learned in Sunday school, with a heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The church was and uh, remained a central part of his life. The church was and remained central in his life. For him, the church was one of the most fundamental realities of the Christian faith. The church was not an organization, but an organism. An organism that worshiped God, the body of Christ, an organism that ministered to the saints, an organism that ministered to the world. Not an organization but an organism. So let us look to this once profound living human document, this parable, to lay bare all that was holy, 
all that was humble and honorable as we seek to keep his legacy alive. His call to ministry. In the early 90s, he answered the call to the ordained ministry, as Father Jones mentioned in his presentation. And what was going on in the 1940s? Surely, throughout the world, persons were facing the Great Depression, the 1930s. And more so, from 1935 to 19, when 1939 rather, to 1945, we had the Second World War. So indeed, there was a lot of grief in the world. A tremendous amount of death. And we are told that over 75 million people died during the Second World War. So a tremendous amount of loss and grief. And it was in this context that, that Archbishop Woodrow answered the call to the ordained ministry. And during the first part of that decade, he tested his vocation at our alma mater, Codrington College, Barbados. Upon completion of his studies and his test of the vocation, he was ordained to the diaconate, ordained as a deacon, however mindful that the deacon is called to serve on April 4th. 1994. And then uh, he was ordained to the Sacred Order of Priests on February 12, 1995. His son was named Andrew, his daughter named Paula, female for the version of Paul. In his early years, in the ordained ministry, he served faithfully as Archdeacon of uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And as we were told by Father Jones in his sketch, he also served in the Diocese of Barbados in various parishes. But in 1967, then the Bishop Bishop Piggott, at the age of 73, recognizing that his retirement was on the horizon, he invited his bishop to return to the Diocese of the Women Islands, where he served as rector and sub dean of St. George's Cathedral, St. Vincent. And no doubt that was in preparation for his calling because our Bishop Piggott saw in him the quality that is needed for a pioneer. His extensive parochial and extensive pastoral experience prepared him for the episcopate, prepared him for higher office. And as a result, we all know he served as Bishop of the Widowed Islands from 1969 to 86, and then appointed as Archbishop of the Church, the wider church in the province of the West Indies from 1980 to 1986. His return to the diocese marked an inflection point in the Diocese of the Windward Islands and the church in the province of the West Indies, an inflection point. Coming out of a colonial identity, Archbishop Woodruff had to chart the course for a new identity. He had to be a pioneer and to keep the larger reality of the church in view as he asserted this new identity, this indigenous identity. His vast pastoral experience enabled him to serve as what my brother Charlie will call a hinge, a hinge that 
closed the old door and opened a new door. The old door of the colonial identity and opened the indigenous door, the new door of the indigenous identity. Through his identity, he was able to achieve the task of asserting this new reality by being true to himself. I know, as Ashika said, that, you know, I am sometimes strong headed or strong willed, but it is important that one remains true to oneself. And to be a church of hope in a grieving world, we have to know who we are. And we have to be true to who we are. We have to be authentic. If you fail to be true to yourself, if you fail to be true to who you are, you are not being authentic. And to be the church of hope in a grieving world, we have to be authentic. People will see to us when we sit or stand by the bedside whether we are true to who we are, whether we truly serve as ministers of God's hope of salvation. And at these times, you know, when you are at the bedside of someone and there is silence, Sometimes you don't know what to say. And how often we sometimes open our mouths and say something which is so unnecessary or foolish. Because quite often we are uncomfortable with silence. We are uncomfortable with just being present. We are called to be authentic in ministry. As the hinge that opened and closed the door between the two identities, Archbishop Woodruff remained authentic even with the change of time. Coming in as the diocesan bishop and later as the Archbishop of the West Indies, he was open to learning and he was open to reforming learning and uh, reforming the church. He was able to tenaciously hold on to some traditions as a safeguard to the fundamentals in ministry. And at the same time, chart a course for an indigenous ministry. So friends, the point is simply this, the stage was set. The stage was set for the first indigenous religious leader in the Anglican church in the region. The stage was set and uh, having that stage set, the church remained central to his life. We all know that in 1969, he was consecrated and enthroned as the sixth bishop of the Diocese of the Windward Islands the, on the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels. He always spoke greatly about that day, the first indigenous bishop of the diocese. And in 1990, he appointed the first indigenous archbishop in the wider church in the province of the West Indies. So the period in which he was ordained was also the period of the disestablishment of the church. The church was now challenged to chart its own course, not depend solely on the Church of England. And that posed a challenge for the selection of indigenous persons to the ordained ministry. It posed a challenge, and we all know that the ordained ministry is a very challenging one. The ordained minister's job is exacting. As clergy, we know that too well. Because the ordained minister has a position of undisputed leadership in the community, and at the time of Bishop Woodruff's ministry, the 
or their leader had an undisputed leadership in their community by virtue of uh, the ordained minister's office the community looked up to the minister because the minister was the spiritual leader who held the keys to eternal life the ordained minister had the answers it was believed to the perplexities of this life and even the life to come. Indeed, he was the best authority in town. The then leader was the one to be consulted and the one to be referred to at all times. Unfortunately, it is not so today. Because with the rise of qualified professionals, lawyers, doctors, accountants in the pews a challenge occurred where the ordained ministers no longer the authority the one with the answers to the perplexities of this life and there was a need to focus on the training because with this establishment from the Church of England was also the separation from the University of Durham and to move to the University of the West Indies. And as a result, there was a contention between forming a department of divinity where ministers would be trained with, to get a bachelor's of divinity or master's of divinity but the students at that time wanted a Bachelor of Arts in Theology or a Master of Arts in Theology. And no doubt, Bishop Woodruff was reluctant in the formation of uh, the Masters of Arts in Theology and the Bachelors of Arts in Theology. But although he was reluctant in the formation, he was open to the wishes of the theological students of the day. But why was he reluctant? He was reluctant because he was more concerned with ministry, training persons for ministry rather than academia. Training persons for ministry rather than uh, academia. I initially thought I benefited from that training with my bachelor's of arts in theology. But now I have come to realize that Archbishop Woodrow's wisdom proved to be profound. And I say this because I honestly believe now, looking back after 25 plus years, as I prepare to retire in the next two years. That Codrillian College is excellent, excellent in preparing clergy for academia, but lack, to a certain degree, preparing persons for ministry, for service. I was fortunate in 1993, as Archdeacon Glasgow mentioned, to be selected to travel to the United States to study clinical pastoral education. And it was through that study of clinical pastoral education, I came to a clearer understanding of the importance of uh, ministry. Then I began to learn about ministry to others and to see Christ in flesh and blood as you sit by or stand by the bedside of someone who is dying. And I returned to Cochrane College, and as, as you can mention, I wrote my thesis on the church's response 
to pastoral care to persons living with HIV at the time. HIV was a terminal illness, but now it's no longer. But at the time, it was the need for the church to be with people who were grieving, people who were dying. And I felt that the church was not making an ample effort to be with those persons. After serving for four years and serving in the Grandies in various positions, I returned in 1999 to continue studies in clinical pastoral education to get a better grasp, a clearer understanding on what really mattered in ministry, what really mattered in the service of others, and the three things that I learned, and I want to share with you tonight. And the first is the art of uh, listening as persons seeking to be part of a church of hope to a grieving world we have to develop the art of listening to people as living human documents listening to the feelings under their words listening to what is not said you know the Sociologists say that more than 55% of our communication is non-verbal. And when we depend solely on verbal communication, we lose a lot of the communication with others. To listen to people, to listen at the feeling level, and by so doing, you are able to get in touch with the other. The art of listening, not just hearing, but listening to their feelings. I remember on one visit, I met a lady at, in the nursing home at her door, and she was praying, and I listened to the prayers I said, and I realized she was praying from the evening prayer from him, from the ancient and modern book of common prayer, in book with the book of common prayer. And I joined her and asked her for permission to join her, and she gave me permission. I joined her. And then she began to share her story with me. Her name was Bernice. And Bernice told me that she had two daughters, one who visited her every day. But she had another daughter that never visited. They had a broken relationship, and indeed, that grieved her tremendously. And then she went on to tell me that the doctor has asked that she go to do a test. I said, I know what the result is. And I didn't press her with regard to what she thought the result was. But she said, my mother had it. My sister had it. My neighbor had it. What was that it? And then she got the courage, or so it seemed, to say the big C. She couldn't get herself to say cancer. Neither did I press her to say. And indeed, I prayed with her. And then a few years later. Okay, so you could you move your mic, please? And there she was at her bedside, depressed. And I invited her to share with me her feelings. And she said, I was right. The results came. And indeed, she had cancer. And then she invited me to share thanksgiving with her. And young and foolish, I said to her, oh, sure, yes. And then thanksgiving came, and when I got to the office, they told me she took a turn for the worse, and she was admitted to the hospital. So I took the train and I went because I promised, you know, when you make a promise, you keep it. And I went to visit her. And she told me about when I got there, she was waiting because father said he's going to come and visit her. 
And then she told me about her daughter who has never visited. And she said to me, my daughter could do what she wants to do. She can do what she has to do, but I will love her nonetheless. She can do what she wants to do, do what she has to do, but I will love her nonetheless. I heard it, but I wasn't listening. And then she invited me to share the meal, but because of New York City law, we cannot participate or share in person's meal. So I took the spoon and I fed her because she was so weak, she couldn't feed herself. And then I said to her, my wife and daughter, they're waiting for me at home to have our Thanksgiving. So although I promise to be with you, I'm here with you, but I cannot stay any longer. And Bernice looked at me dead in the eye and said, do what you want to do. Do what you have to do. I will love you nonetheless. Well, the water work started. Do what you want to do. Do what you have to do. I will love you nonetheless. And then I went home for Thanksgiving and uh, the next day I got a call that Bernice passed away. And the then rector called me and said that this young lady says you, you ministered to a mother in the nursing home in the hospital and they wanted you to do the... And I asked who it was and then he told me it was Bernice. And I prepared the sermon and I went to do the service. I, and while I was in the pulpit, it dawned on me, when Bernice said she would like me to be with her at Thanksgiving, it was not this turkey and cranberry sauce and pumpkin pie. It was the Eucharistia, the Thanksgiving. And I was able to celebrate that Thanksgiving. The art of listening, listening to what's not said, listening to feelings on the words, listening deeper than you hear, the words you hear. The second thing I want to share with you with regard to clinical pastoral education and being a church of hope in the grieving world is to be present with people in their moments of grief far too often we have experience of that where in clergy come and they're more concerned about something else than concerned about your position of loss or your position of brokenness but being present with people in the moment of grief is part of our ministry I remember again being asked to visit a man named Big Lou. And I went to the apartment building and I made sure I was in the right apartment and I rang the bell and there was no answer. But then I persisted and eventually I got an answer and I was buzzed in. I went in, I found the apartment knock on the door again there was no answer for a little while and i was about to turn and go back to the church and i heard the locks being opened and the door slowly opened and as the door opened the putrid odor struck me but i was invited in and i entered that apartment, disarray, badly kept. But I remembered the need to be present even in that uncomfortable place, that uncomfortable moment. I introduced myself and Lou introduced himself and I saw a picture of what he was. He was now a shadow of himself. And I invited him to share his story. And Lou told me of his diabetes, 
He told me about his hypertension. He told me about his dialysis every three days. And uh, I just kept thinking, how much could one man endure? And then he told me about his cardiac condition. He had a heart attack. And he said to me, the last thing he could remember before he went out, he was saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And that took me right back to Good Friday. And there I was able to sit with Lou in that state and experience Jesus Christ in flesh and blood by being present. You know, sometimes we are by the bedside of someone and we're thinking about what we're going to do in the office or what we're going to do when we leave and fail to have that presence, be present with people in the moment of grief. And as I listened to Big Lou, I asked him, you know, Scripture tells us we're two or three are gathered together. God is in the midst. And God is here with us. What would you like to say to God? And he looked at me dead in the eye and said, thank God for life. Well, that blew me. Here you have a man who is diabetic. He has hypertension. He is on dialysis. He had a heart attack. He had an amputation. And yet he could find something for which to give God thanks. And how many times, even as ministers, we get bent out of shape for foolishness and fail to thank God for calling us to ministry to be a source of comfort, a source of encouragement, a source of support to others in the moments of grief and brokenness. But as we engage in this art of listening and as we seek to be present with people who are grieving we are also called to assess their spiritual needs assess the spiritual needs of the persons in our pastoral care to assess the needs whether the need to be reassured of God's forgiveness, the need to be reassured of hope, of comfort, of love. That is what really matters when we minister to persons in uh, our pastoral care. As pioneer, Archbishop Woodruff sought to assert the indigenous identity of the ordained minister as a qualified leader who cares for the faithful. The focus is or should be on ministry rather than on academia. As a preacher, his presence was awe-inspiring. His larger-than-life presence was captivating. As a young star, as a kid, I always remember him telling stories with that booming voice. He had a holy presence with compassion and humility. A holy presence with compassion and humility. I have always been mesmerized you know, when uh, he came to visit Holy Trinity Castries St. Lucia and quite often have been awestruck. And I know many persons remain nostalgic about his inspiring and enlightening sermons. But I must confess to you tonight that I do not recall any of his sermons. I don't recall any of his sermons. I recall, he was one who always tells stories, but I cannot recall any of his sermons. Maybe he had a dose of Alzheimer's, I don't know. But the important thing I learned from this is that when we sometimes spend an hour, 45 minutes an hour preaching, how much of that do people recall? But what I recall is how he made me feel when he confirmed me that booming voice 
Defend, O Lord, thy servant Denison with thy heavenly grace, that he may continue thine forever and then increase in the Holy Spirit more and more until he comes to your everlasting kingdom. And in my little voice, I said, Amen. It was Mahatma Gandhi who once said, my life is my message. My life is my message. For what Bishop Woodruff, his life was his message. The message of a profound preacher that was in the form of teaching. And that brings me back to the time when I was preparing to test my vocation at Codrington College. And initially, I wasn't accepted because I had to do two more O-level subjects. And he wrote me a letter, a letter that focused on the ordained ministry as a means of grace. And I never forgot that. The means of grace. His letter was a letter that provided great support. It provided tremendous encouragement with comfort and compassion in the moment of my grief. He supported my efforts to test my vocation. He encouraged me not to give up. And he comforted me when many others thought of me as a failure. He gave me spiritual support, spiritual encouragement, and spiritual comfort. And I learned from that encounter that God's grace is always sufficient to overcome grief, as simple as it may be, or as profound as it may be. And that led me to experience him as a pastor, as a pastor. As chief pastor, he related to, as Father Jones mentioned, to all his clergy as father. But he did so with humility. He did so with compassion. He was always a beloved father in God. And I experienced this firsthand. When the time came for, at the completion of my ordination or oh my sorry my testing of vocation sorry and preparation for ordination there was no bishop in the diocese the, the, the episcopate was vacant because at that time bishop elder resigned on february 28th and archbishop would have sought permission from the then archbishop Ornan Lindsay. He sought permission and he received permission to ordain me and to ordain then the late deacon Ralph Moore. May his soul rest in peace. And uh, as we were preparing for ordination, there was an elective synod. And uh, Bishop Goodrich, Sion Goodrich, was elected bishop of the diocese. And then Archbishop called us in. He called, called us in, Deacon Moore and myself, and he informed us that since a new bishop was elected, we should wait for him to be consecrated and enthroned so that he could have the privilege to ordain us. And after that, meeting with Archbishop Woodruff and the discussion with Deacon Moore at the time and he was very upset and he was out of character because he was unbeknownst to me expressing mask grief because Deacon Moore was terminally ill he died two years later and delaying or waiting five more months would have uh, deprived him of uh, his desire to be ordained.
But we eventually were ordained on the Feast of St. Thomas, my patron saint, in 1994. Feast of St. Thomas, December 21st, 1994. And Archbishop Woodruff gave us his blessing. And then the encounter, I'd like to share tonight as we look at the, the role of the church in dealing with persons with grief is Archbishop Woodrow facilitating the preparation for my ordination to the priesthood. And uh, we had several sessions, and on one of the sessions, he recalled Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, that there was silence in heaven for half an hour. And he asked me, at that time as a deacon, deacon, why is there silence in heaven for half an hour? And I kept silent, because I believe if you don't know the answer, keep your mouth shut. But I pondered it, and I came up with nothing. I came up with nothing. And I tried to remember my notes from Dr. Scott Gambrell, our lecturer on Revelation, and I thought how John related an extended version of God's throne room, how the Lamb was on the throne, the Lamb is handed a scroll with seven seals, the Lamb breaks open the seals one at a time, and then after each, one is open, there is a judgment on the earth, and then the seventh seal was open, and there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Was it to show respect and awe in the presence of God? I couldn't figure it out. Was it deep reflection on what was revealed? Was it in anticipation to what is about to happen, the calm before the storm? Why is there silence in heaven for half an hour? And then Archbishop Woodrow said to me, Negan, scripture doesn't specify the reason, but do you know what you can do in half an hour? Again, I was blank. And he said to me, you can say a good said mass. Not rushed, not fast, but a good said mass. And I smiled, I was dumbfounded, and I felt relieved because he planted the seed in my heart and my mind of the centrality of the mass, the centrality of the blessed sacrament of the altar. Yes, the liturgy of the word is important. Yes, the lessons are important. Yes, preaching is important. But the celebration of the Eucharist is central to being the church. In the Greek, ecclesia. In the, in the Hebrew, the kahal. The ecclesia, those called out. The kahal, the assembly. It's important to be the church. And if you look at our churches, the architectural design is in what we call the cruciform, in the form of a cross. And on one side is the lectern, on the other side is the pulpit. But in the center, in the center of the church is the altar. So at the heart of our worship is the Eucharist, in the Greek, Eucharistia, which means what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving through the body and blood of Christ to bring hope to people who are grieving. And that's why I always say to people, when you have the opportunity to make your communion, to make your communion, it is the blessed sacrament of the altar, the body and blood of Christ. We have people talking foolishness, like, I am not taking sacrament, this is the, the, the sacrament, nobody can tell me when to take communion. No. That is God's gift of grace to us. And the efficacy of the sacrament does not depend on the celebrant. And that's why we ought to always be mindful of the need to receive the body and blood of Christ 
to strengthen us, to enable us to go through our moments of brokenness and grief. I also remember another experience I had with Archbishop Woodrow as pastor. And he taught me about priestly craft, the priestly craft. And he thought about the ABC, I guess some of you have heard about him say this, the ABC of the priesthood, the fundamentals of the priesthood. The ABC of the priesthood. A, to absolve God's people of their sins. B, to bless them and C, to consecrate the elements. A, to absorb. To be God's agent to pronounce the forgiveness of sins, but later that seed was watered. That seed which he planted was watered by my clinical pastoral education training in the United States. And the Spirit gave the increase. In CPE, the Reverend Dr. Joel Warner Jr., who was a student of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the author of that famous book on death and dying, helped me to come to a clear understanding of what the dying can teach the living, what the dying can teach the grieving. And as a minister, how important it is to allow yourself to be taught by the dying that when we receive, like Bernice received that diagnosis, that terminal diagnosis, how sometimes we try to deny it and we become angry and even try to bargain with God. And when all of that doesn't work, we become so depressed. But as a minister, we are called to journey with people, to listen to their feelings, to be present, to assess their spiritual needs so that they could come to that stage of acceptance. I agree. Who's the backup? Absorb God's people from their sins, but be to bless them. To bless them. And to just slowly, you know, when we speak about give blessing, we all raise our hand three feet to right, two feet, and we, we pronounce the blessing. But that seed which Sir George Covered Manning Woodruff, Archbishop, planted in me was watered by the late Dr. Henry J. Nowen. And once again, the Spirit gave the increase. It was Dr. Nowen who enlightened me to understand that to bless is from the Latin benedictio, which is a compound word. Two words. Bene, which means good. Dictio, which means word. To say a good word and to live by that good word or to live under the good word with the heart of a pastor. Not as a manager of a church, nor as an administrator of a parish, but as a servant of God and the people of God. To say that good word. How many times has the church or members of the church, all that comes from our mouth is criticism and ridicule rather than benedictio, a blessing, saying a good word. And thirdly, in the ABC of the priesthood, he taught me that we need to consecrate the elements for God's people. You see, as a priest, every Sunday, or some of us every day, or every midweek, we go to the altar to celebrate the Mass. And in the consecration of the elements, Dr. Nowen points out four verbs, four primary verbs that we use to take, to bless, to break, and to give. To take, to bless, to break, and to give. And he, he goes on to explain how to take is such a dry word. So he chose a warmer and softer word to choose, to remind the grieving, to remind the broken, that in spite of their loss, 
that they are special to God. They are chosen by God. But in spite of their brokenness and their grief, they are blessed. Yes, they are broken. And as a matter of fact, every one of us is broken. I am broken. You are broken. Whether you believe it or not, we are all broken. My brokenness may not be your brokenness, and your brokenness may not be my brokenness. But how often we see others' brokenness and we judge them rather than recognizing that we are all broken people in need of healing. We are broken. But it's when we are able to accept our brokenness, embrace our brokenness, that we are able to give of ourselves to the world, ministering to the world, to choose, to bless, to break, and even in our brokenness, to give of ourselves to the world. The psychologists and all the professionals define grief as the reaction you have in response to loss in your life. Whether this loss is as a result of death or your physical ability or your cognitive ability. We all see grief in terms of death, but many people are grieving because of the, the loss of physical ability. We cannot do the things we used to do. <laughs> Either arthritis has kicked in, or blood pressure or diabetes, and we have lost a great deal of our physical ability. And there is a degree of grief in that loss or cognitive ability. Not necessarily Alzheimer's, but sometimes if you put your key or your telephone down, you do not know in five minutes where you place it. Or maybe you've had your glasses on your face and ask, where are my glasses? But there is the response to loss in our life. It's also defined as a deep sorrow, especially that which is caused when someone is experiencing loss. But I like the working definition of grief, and I want to commend that to you tonight. The feeling that you have or someone else has or experiences when one loses someone or something or an ability that one once had. That feeling that you have when you lose something or someone that you once cherish. And as a result, everyone grieves in unique ways. Always remember that. And it is okay if you grieve in a way that is different from those around you. It's okay if your grief is different. It is possible to be unaware that you are grieving. You may be grieving about something and you may be reacting to others and you're not even aware that you're grieving. And it's also possible that you are unaware of a loss that deserves to be grieved. Coming up in the West Indies, you have often heard a person say, you know, you're a man, you just don't, don't cry, don't, don't worry about this, you know, grow up. Rather than recognizing that there is need to spend time to grieve over that loss. There are eight primary types of grief, and I won't go into them tonight because this is not a session on um, psychology. But we can identify in these eight types of grief how we ourselves or someone else is struggling at this current time. Whether it's anticipatory grief, expecting to lose something, something or someone, or if it's normal grief, going through the normal process of feeling that emotion of loss, or delayed grief, trying to be bold and, and firm now and, and later on find ourselves collapsing and not being able to handle the issue, or complicated grief, not being able to pinpoint what is it that we are grieving. Or disenfranchisement grief, disenfranchised grief, where persons think that you know we shouldn't be grieving about that. 
other persons have worse. That's one of the worst things as ministers we can see. Because to everyone, their grief is primary. Or to chronic grief, which disables us that we can't even work on. Or cumulative grief like Big Lou. Not having time to grieve the loss of his arm or the heart attack, but grief after grief after grief. Or mass grief, as I mentioned with Father Norm. Responding out of character because of some deep inner loss. And friends, although grief is common to all cultures in the world, it is not a static concept. It's a dynamic way for the church, for you and for me, for us to view our relevance while ministering in a world filled with grief. As the church, the ecclesia, they called out, the kahal, the assembly, we are called out and we assemble to minister, to serve others as God in Christ served us. To engage in the ministry of absolution, to engage in the ministry of benediction, to engage in the ministry of consecration. Serving people where they are in a non-judgmental way, to journeying with them with compassion, with empathy to the place of hope where God wants them to be. The final story I'll share tonight is the story with our secondment to St. Lucia in preparation for the birth of our daughter, Danae. When my wife, Faye, and I were expecting our daughter, Danae, we had, unbeknownst to us, anticipatory grief due to medical complications, loss, physical loss of uh, a safe and healthy child. And we were required to return to St. Lucia for the last trimester. And I remember as Bishop Hood was saying to me, son, before you leave on your way to the airport, bring her to me. Just again, bring her to me. You know his baby voice. Even at that age, he still had that commanding voice. Bring her to me. And I said, yes, your grace. And the day of travel came, and I brought my wife, Faye, to Archbishop. And he placed his hands on her enlarged stomach. Today, they would want to call that uh, a sexual harassment. But he was a man of great repute. A man to be respected to his last breath. He placed his hand on her stomach and he prayed for safe delivery. And then he blessed her and the baby. And he said to her, you will be okay. You will be okay. Well, indeed, his words came to pass. Dene was born a healthy five pound, eight ounce child. And she has dedicated her life to be a blessing. She has always been a blessing to us. And she has dedicated her life to be a blessing to others through the profession of the medical field. And she's halfway through her medical training and is starting her PhD at Princeton University in August. You will be okay. He listened to our feelings of fear. He remained present with us in that moment of uh, anticipatory grief. He assessed our spiritual needs. And he ministered to us as a true pastor to remind us that we will be okay. So my friends, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Rather, I am going to commend to you these six important stages or steps rather by Dr. Alan Wolfert. Dr. Alan Wolfert. And uh, 
as you listen to the story of those who are broken and those who are grieved. I trust not that you will remain present in that sacred space, that you'll assess their spiritual needs and journey with them, bringing hope. And the first thing I want you to remember as Dr. Wolfelt advocates is to acknowledge the reality of person's loss. As a minister to bring hope to people who are grieving, you have to acknowledge the reality of their loss. And as you journey with them, they too can come to that acknowledgement. And the way by which you acknowledge the reality of loss is to embrace the pain of the loss. I know it is painful to stay with pain. It is painful to stay with pain. But we are called to embrace that pain. And as we acknowledge the reality of loss, as we embrace the pain, we remember the person who was lost or the thing that was lost. Acknowledge it, embrace it, remember it. And through that process, you will be able to develop a new self-identity in the face of the absence of that person or that thing, in the face of the loss. And as I, I have always advocated, that every experience should be a teachable moment. So you can search for meaning in the experience of loss. Here you have Big Lou. He's lost part of his hand, he's lost his health, and yet he could find something for which to give God thanks. Thank God for life. Search for meaning in the experience of loss. And... Uh, Always be open. Always be open to receive ongoing support from others. None of us has all the answers. I know many persons think they have all the answers. None of us has all the answers. So we must always be open to receive support, encouragement, and comfort from others. And as we do this as ministers, we can model for the grieving how to acknowledge the reality of loss, to embrace it, to remember the thing of the person lost, and develop that new self-identity by searching for meaning and to be open to the ongoing support of loss. So, my friends, let us keep Archbishop Woodruff's legacy as a pioneer, a preacher, and a pastor at the forefront of our lives as we strive to be the church of hope in the green world. As a pioneer, we remember his work. So as pioneers, let us be open to establishing indigenous approaches to ministry. As a preacher, we may not remember his sermons, but as preachers, let us live our lives as our message, as parables, earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. As a pastor, we all can recall many ways he has been pastor to us with the heart of a priest or bishop. So as pastors, let us be committed, committed to ministering to people with a humble and compassionate heart as we bring hope to them in the face of their brokenness, in the face of their grief. So God bless you all. God bless his memory. And may his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed to the tender mercy of God rest in peace. I thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father Richard for your remarkable, timely, and fulfilling lecture this evening. You reminded us about the importance of being true to self. And I find that so true because with a knowledge of self, who we are and what we're about, this is the only way in which we're going to be able to fuel 
the ministry that God has called us to do. You mentioned encompassing the act of listening, being present, and assessing spiritual need. And those three components, I think, are so very ideal because in times like these, the support and the love of God within God's people is vital so that we are actually able to carry out his, his mission and his ministry. And in no way can we show love if we don't know love. Right. We can't show compassion if we don't know compassion. And so with the importance of self and the knowledge of self, I found very, very inspiring and timely. I also found it quite interesting that you remember what Father would have, how he made you feel, and not so much what he would have said or what possibly he would have done. And this is symbolic of ministry because to be an individual that feels positive growth, that motivates and that inspires people, is what we ultimately should have destined to be. So I want to thank you for reliving your experience of a pioneer, a preacher, and a pastor. An experience that I hope would enable us to make greater impacts and to transform life. Once again, Father Richard, thank you very much. At this time, I want to acknowledge the presence of Archbishop Woodruff's son, Andrew, and his daughter, Paula. We are extremely delighted to have you here with us this evening. My very own dean, the very Reverend O. Samuel Nichols, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here, for being present. We are happy to have you as well. I also noted the presence of Father Ashton Francis, Father Junior Ballantyne, Father Brooker, and I just want to say welcome. Thank you, thank you. And I find it so enriching, so fulfilling that despite everything, including geographical differences, we are still able to fellowship here to be, and that is very symbolic. It is also important to note that we are currently at 112 viewers on our YouTube channel. And I want to thank our viewers for staying with us. And I trust that so far, your experience has been a wonderful one and you're already filled to go forth in God's name. At this time, we'll have the question and answer segment. Here you are three. Our virtual audience, you are free to submit any questions that you may have. You can do so via WhatsApp at 455-7802. Or for persons who are on the Zoom chat, you can simply raise your hand and we will get to you and take your question. Also on the YouTube chat, in the comment section, you can also submit your questions there. And we will also be there to answer. So I will <coughs> extend a few moments to see if anyone is interested in submitting a question. Good evening, everybody. Um, I guess I'd like to start off with a question. A question that I have is, um, I think you spoke a lot about how being present for other people can oftentimes put you in a position of being, I guess, emotionally connected to people that are suffering. How are you able to care for yourself um, in moments where you also have to be a servant to others? Thank you very much for that question. And um, what is very, very fascinating about 
caring for oneself in, in pastoral care is that quite often when I go to minister to persons who are sick or dying, I leave that encounter with them having ministered to me. Because, for example, I mean, I have several, but the, the two I brought forth was Big Lou, who was, he had, he had diabetes, had blood pressure, he, had, he was on dialysis, he had amputation. And you know, dialysis or kidney failure is very important to, to me because having, having my wife had, had uh, renal failure in 99 and having donated a kidney to her. Um, it, it really touched me. And there you have someone who is in that state. And I'm asking myself, how much could one person go through? And he, he is saying to me, thank God for life. What he did for me, he was ministering to me and uh, enabled me to see things in a more profound way. Bernice, I shared the story of Bernice, and these two stories are so dear to me, I remember them for the rest of my life. How Bernice ministered to me, how I'm able to experience um, care. No one before Bernice in my life ever showed me unconditional grace. No bishop, no priest spelled it out to me as this elderly woman did, not even lecturers at seminary, were able to put it to me in such a profound way. Do what you want to do, do what you have to do, and I would love you nonetheless. And that for me brought all my knowledge and education and training and efforts, it brought it together to enable me to recognize my chosenness, my blessedness, even in my brokenness. God used Bernice to minister to me his unconditional grace. So thank you for that question. And uh, um, I commend that to my fellow clergy as well. And as we go to minister to others, they in turn minister to us. And that's why you must always be open to receive support from others. Thank you. Um, Arch, oh, Mother, Mother Glasgow says, um, thank you, Denison. For me, this is not a moment of questioning, but for reflecting and internalizing the level of passion and conviction how to enter the brokenness of others. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. If we, I think if CNN we, has a question. Your hand is up. Yes. Yes, I have. I have a question I'd like to ask you. Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> what or do you believe as a, a priest mm. after listening to your lecture the importance of giving last rites to someone who is sick and someone to, who is dying? Do you believe that it is important? And if you do, could you tell us why it is important that the priest should give one his last rites on the same okay. so, so, Certainly. Thank you for that question. Um, interestingly enough, that um, in modern times and today, we don't really call it last rites, we call it the uh, sacrament of holy unction. Um, I know in the early days, Archbishop would have um, used the same term, the last rites. It is important. It is very important. And why is it important? This is important because the individual who is at his or her last hour facing the inevitable by being present and uh, pronouncing, asking them or going with, joining with them, sorry, with, with, with confessing their sins and uh, Pronouncing the absolution provides 
spiritual support and comfort in that very fearful hour. And the holy unction, as I said, now it's called, I've had situations where persons were given months or weeks to live um, by the doctors, and after receiving holy unction, they were discharged, and they have gone on to live many more years. So it is important. Always remember, it's important. And it's important for members of the church to always, and as scripture says, if you're sick, call your priests, and they may pray for you and anoint you with holy oil. Okay? So it is to help persons if they have any unresolved issues, if they have, they have the need to seek forgiveness for something that they have done, that you are able to hear the confession, pronounce absolution, anoint them with holy oil to give them hope and comfort, whether it's in the last hour as they prepare to meet their maker, or that they may be healed to continue a meaningful and fruitful and purposeful life until God calls them to his nearer presence. So thank you for that question. I just hope I have answered the question. Father Richards. Yes, um, yes, as you can. Permit me to um, support your response to CNN relative to function. Yes. There's, there's also another section to that which is extremely important for in administering the sacrament of unction, you're also ministering to those who are still alive, particularly the family members, and in more ways than one, helping them to be prepared for the eventuality of death, and by extension, bringing closure if and when it does happen. In addition, in, in addition for those of us who function in parishes here in the islands, it is also very helpful that when these sacraments are being administered, that the church is present, not just the priest, but also members of the visitation team, if possible, to bear witness and to give necessary comfort and support of being family, of being the body of Christ. So it, this, this, this sacrament is extremely important and has great value for the growth, development, and the faith of those who will still be alive even after the person receives this, the sacrament has gone on. Very important. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ashikin um, Lassa, for mentioning that. Um, and in addition, sometimes you're called to the bedside and uh, the family members are not there. So as Ashikin Lassa mentioned, if they're there, yes, it provides some comfort for them. But sometimes they're not there and um, and you have that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and sometimes you're not even able to speak with the individual. You just have to uh, reassure them of your presence. And, um, and that could be very, very comforting in the last hour. So thank you, Archie Glasgow. Thank you, Sinan. I think I saw... Before, um, you go, before you go on to the the O'Brien Richards. Yes. In the context of ministry in St. Vincent. Yes. We have had a dengue outbreak. We are with COVID. We have had a volcanic eruption. We have had flooding. Mudslides. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that keep coming mm -hmm. um, as I encounter persons in different walks of life is what next for us? Mm -hmm. And as you spoke about anticipatory grief, I get the sense that white cross section of incensions yes. mm -hmm. are there. And most times when that what next question comes up, you will hear people saying, the hurricane season is coming. We're on the heels of the hurricane season. And so it's almost as though we are already priming ourselves for what next. Yes. And so from, in terms of our mental state, Mm -hmm. um, it's challenging, it's challenging. It's challenging, yes it is. Okay. My, my answer, my answer is yeah. a 
seven Father Richards. Are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead, go ahead, Father yes, um, I think our anthems speak very eloquently to that question, Dean. What air the future brings of faith will see us through. Um, secondly, if I may, correct who is CNN and say the gentleman, do I know him who's, who's CNN? I would like to know from this vantage point. Who is he really? Is, is it a priest? No, he is not. Okay. He's Clement Nigel Nicholas from St. Lucia. <laughs> <laughs> from, 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 where, from where, St. Lucia? St. Lucia, yes. <laughs> Holy, Holy, Holy Trinity? Holy Trinity? Holy, Holy Trinity. Okay, thank you, thank you. Evil yeah. Gordon. You have a prison, look, I thought you were a prison one for me. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I'm knocking on the door. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Father Jones, for, for, for that point. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that we hold our faith um, in God that um, in all things and all circumstances, by the grace of God, we can find something for which we can give God thanks. So, so in addition to what Father Jones said, um, Dean, Dean Nichols, um, yes, the, it's real. The fear is real. They had the dengue, they had COVID, they had um, chikungunya, they had the flooding, the, the, the volcanic eruption. But... We must seek to make our faith relate to our experiences. Because if our faith does not relate to our experiences, there is a disconnect. It is not relevant. So, yes, we need to listen to their feelings. And they're real. The fear is real. What next? What next? What can we do? So it is our duty as ministers. Not to just brush it away and think, oh, no, forget about it, or we have the vaccine for COVID. No, but to listen to them and to be present with them in that moment of fear and to journey with them as we recognize their need for comfort, their spiritual need for support, and uh, enable them to look back on uh, their life. Because don't forget, every one of us was born with a blank slate. Every one of us. We were born for blank slate. Today, May 20th, 2021, every one of us holds certain things there. There's certain things we detest, there's certain things we love. Where did that come from? It came from our experiences over the years. So we can learn from these experiences. Yes, we went through the, the, um, the dengue. Yes, we, we went through COVID. Yes, we had the volcanic eruption. Yes, we're going to have hurricanes every year. We had the hurricane season from June to November. But in spite of all these experiences, we as the church must see the need to connect our experiences with our faith as we celebrate the Mass and give God thanks. The one who will see us through all these experiences. We cannot say that God is a healer if we're never sick, right? We cannot say that God is a defender if we never find ourselves faced with something to be defended against. So through all our experiences, we need to connect our faith. So be honest with them. Be present with them as they share the feelings, listen to the words on, on the feelings and under the words, and uh, assess their spiritual needs. I hope that answers your questions, um, Dean Nichols. Yeah. Now, I think we have a, a question um, here. The church in the Windward Islands is functioning against the backdrop of an ever-changing and dynamic environment in the world. We in this diocese are accused of being old-fashioned and stagnant. Our stance on most issues may be aptly described as change inertia. How do you see the re-energizing of our current operation, operating sorry, ethos as a, as, a, as a change agent for modernizing in the pursuit of God's ministry moving forward? Well, um, I think that's from O'Brien, Richards. When we speak in terms of the church being old-fashioned and stagnant, we need to ask persons, you know, what do you mean by the church is stagnant? What do you mean by the church is old-fashioned? And quite often people will tell you about, you know, what many of the modern churches are doing. 
My experience with Archbishop Woodruff, remember the ABC of ministry. Because quite often the things we take for being an active and vibrant church is religious entertainment and has nothing to do with the church as an organism. It's more to deal with organizations. And that's why I maintain fundraisers, fish fry, big sale, jumbo sale, um, bus ride, boat ride, all these activities, bazaars, we seem to engage in them and through the engagement see the church is active and alive. No, that is not the church, the purpose and the nature of the church. That is for an organization. That's not for the church, the organism. So when people speak about the church being old-fashioned, stagnant, that is their right. You cannot prevent people from saying what they want to say. You just have to be true to yourself and be the church. Be the church. Members of the body of Christ, those who are called out, those who are symbol, to give God thanks. So that, as Deacon Nichols said, when the, when the hurricanes come, or COVID, or, 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 or the dengue fever, or the, the volcanic eruption, when all these things in life come, see how much of the jumping and the hollering and the band and the music and the enjoyment sustain them through it all. We have to recognize our faith as members of the body of Christ has to be clearly manifested. Manifested in terms of the sacrament of the altar, the body and blood of Christ, the one who died for our salvation. Music will die out. Activities will fade. When they die out and they fade, what do we have to sustain us? And for me, that is the question. And it's not so much as being anxious or concerned about people calling you old-fashioned or stagnant. Be true to yourself and your worship of God with thanksgiving in the Eucharist. I trust and hope that answers your question. Moderator, through you and Father Richard, Dr. Richards, I'd like to hear Professor Charles Simmons on this. <laughs> Charlie? And meet yourself there. Yeah. You, your, your wisdom is repressing. Uh, am I unmuted to? Uh... Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, it's it is it is it is a tough. It is really tough um, situation to re to respond to. I I agree with my brother Dennison that uh, we we must really be clear. Um, in terms of what what those terms mean, uh, the the and, and, and more and more as, as we move to the twenty first century, we the thing we we must really uh, begin to distinguish between you know what does what endures basically what what is it about the church that that endures and not merely work. Uh, I I have myself a at times felt that the church was was not as and i hate to use this word pro progressive as yeah. as 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 i would like uh in my younger days and as i move uh into middle age i i give thanks to god that the church was not as progressive <laughs> you know what i'm saying as as i would have liked for it uh to be because there there is a, you know i i my sense of it that uh there are some things that are about the world eternal now we live in a world that is sort of lost a, a sense of the eternal and, and therefore it, it it throws the, the church in crisis you know we 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 bear witness to things that the world no longer understands and you know during this easter season one of the things i love about the gospel of john is is, is it heightens the tension between being the church and 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 and, and and bearing witness to a world that doesn't understand what 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 that actually means. So 
I think it's going to be an ongoing uh, thing for us. Um, you know, we, we what matters most, though, I, I, I agree with my brother Dennison, is that, you know, we focus on the fundamentals, uh, on, on those things that I actually endure. You know, the celebration of the Eucharist is at the heart of, of who we are, the, the, the proclamation of the word uh, being Jesus. And, of course, the, the, the compassion with which he speaks. Uh, you know, um, meeting the social needs of the people uh, as, as who we minister to. Uh, I think that's that's ultimately uh, one of the uh, one of the great litmus tests of what it means to to be church. Uh, you know, uh, it, but but Bishop, it, it is a hard it is a hard hard situation for us. Uh, and I think my brother he's done a good job. Uh, you know, in terms of being pioneers and you know, in terms of being proclaimers and in terms of being pastors, these are the sort of fundamental things. That, uh, that ultimately endure. Um, each generation will have their detractors. The church would always come up. Sometimes we will go from being uh, detractors to being the great lovers of, uh, you know, of, of that which is. Uh, but there's no other institution in the world, and I, I say this uh, very proudly, that has survived, uh, you know, 2,000 years. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They, uh, not not as an organized, not as, as my brother said, not as an organization, but as an organism animated uh, when we come on Sunday by the presence of the Holy Spirit. There, there, there is something wonderful about uh, you know this this sacred mystery. So, you know, um, I'm rambling, but you know that's my immediate <laughs> my immediate thing. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, but we didn't uh, the, the, the left talk today. The whole question of the dengue fever, the pandemic, the volcanic kind of eruption, and all people looking forward to what next as the hurricane season approaches. Um, sometimes we, we we tend to find easy answers in order to comfort ourselves. Oh, what did you say about that to the grieving process? Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you for that. Um, I mentioned that it is painful to stay with pain. It is painful to stay with pain. As ministers, we are called to be present, to be with people in the moments of pain, anguish, even to the point of death. So. Ours is not to look for easy answers. And quite often, many ministers, when they are in a position, in an uncomfortable position, sometimes they open their mouth and say some things which they should not say. So, in spite of the fact that it may be painful to say, it is also okay to say to persons, I do not know. However, let us trust God and pray that he will reveal it to us as we journey together. So we need to try to avoid these easy answers to comfort ourselves. Rather, we are called to do the tough work to acknowledge, in spite of the fact many persons may think we have all the answers for this life and the life to come, to say, look, I don't know. But what I do know is that I am with you through this. Jesus is with us through this. So that when the time comes, we will be able to comfort one another, strengthen one another, so that we can endure this. Our faith will see us through. How, when, I don't know. But at the appointed time, at the appointed time, God will Act. All right, Bishop. All right. Um, I think we have some questions online. Um, again, um, I'm referring to the management system of the church and how we maintain our core values as Christians and at the same time improve our output. The fact that we have in this very active place technology is to be the emerging echoes that I'm referring to. How do we manage the two? 
Okay. Um, okay. So there's a, a question with regard to emerging to advanced technology and uh, uh, the church uh, being seen as old-fashioned and stagnant. Um, I think that this question answers itself um, because we are in fact emerging too. We're using technology, but that in no way diminishes the fact that um, we hold sacred those fundamentals of our faith. So there's nothing wrong with technology per se, but we can still hold our faith, the fundamentals of our faith, in spite, as a result of COVID-19, where we're not able to be with each other. So yes, changes are to be made, but under no circumstance should we compromise our fundamentals of faith. I just hope that answers your question. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for that very active and um, detailed question and answer segment. I believe that we gathered quite a bit from that um, session, and I trust that the questions posed were answered in a very clear and concise manner. I trust those too. Yes. And in the spirit of gratitude, we know that gratitude is essential. And so I will call on Miss Fortuna Anthony from the Holy Trinity Parish Church in Castries, St. Lucia, to offer us the vote of thanks. Thank you, um, Mrs. of Ceremony. Let me hope that. Um, we are all energized. And let me say a very blessed good night to all our esteemed attendees. I have been designated the task to express thanks to all who have made this evening's proceeding possible. However, may I beg your indulgence to extend our respect to our Lord Bishop of the Windward Island, the Right Reverend C. Leopold Friday, our esteemed presenter, the Reverend Dr. Dennison Richards, and our many members of the clergy and all other participants. I am indeed humbled so I've been asked to extend thanks and gratitude to the many individuals who have made this evening possible. Thessalonians 3 verse 19 says, For whatever thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy we feel for your sake before our God. But there is also the works, research work of Emmons and McCollins that says that I'm giving thanks has to do a lot with our mental well-being. They found out that people who are grateful has less depression and stress, they have lower blood pressure, they have more energy, they are greater in optimism and they do better at bonding with other people. Therefore, let me begin with a smile to extend our sincerest thanks to the team of persons who were instrumental in planning today's presentation. I commend you and say that it has been a task well executed. I have no doubt that it took excellent leadership to have planned and executed despite the new normal. We say a big thank you to you for a job well done. To our mistress of ceremony, Miss Henry, thank you 
for taking us through this program and your impressive summaries. To the Venerable Marshal, I must say, the power of prayer can never be questioned. And you set the tone for success. We know that all things are possible with God. And your prayers was guiding the light. Praise and thanks to you. Our sincerest thanks to our Lord Bishop, the Right Reverend Leopold Friday, for his warm and chronological account of the reasons for this lecture. It was an inspiring welcome, and to you I say thank you. No doubt you set the tone and the much needed environment to help us through this medium. Reverend Father Ulrich Jones, you place this presentation in context and I have no doubt that the historical background, the profile of the Archbishop Woodworth illustrated the relevance and importance of such a memorial lecture for many of us. I say a heartfelt thank to you. It is well known that those who affect change must understand the past, if the present and the future is to bring about meaningful change. I say sincerest thanks to Deputy Principal Richardson for your um, remembrance of the, and speaking of the symbolic relationship required between church and school. Thank you for sharing with us. Sincerest thanks go out to Mr. Ronnie Richardson, member of staff, for your special rendition. A powerful message, song. We thank you for sharing your God-given talent and gift with us. No doubt, we will all strive to leave a legacy of faith for the younger and future generation. Thank you, our most vulnerable Christian Glasgow, Archdeacon of St. Lucia. We express our thanks for the compelling and informative and in-depth introduction of a son of the St. Lucian soil and our most esteemed presenter. Indeed, as you noted, it was the right choice. To our many dignitaries, clergymen and women, I thank you for your presence, your participation, and the many questions of interest that you have posed. I know that time has been a factor, but I'm sure that there will be another time to continue this dialogue. You have been, we could not have wished for a better audience. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not usually the norm to leave the guest speaker, the esteemed presenter for last. But I do not usually follow fashion, and I wish to leave you tonight with a grateful heart. As I say, merci, gracias, domo, to our honored presenter, Reverend Dr. Richards. Our gratitude and thanks go out to you for graciously accepting to deliver this memorial lecture. You have inspired us all with your thoughts on a topic which I have no doubt many of us eagerly anticipated. I'm just going to say it was grounded, it was powerful, it was real. We have extended, you have exceeded, sorry, our expectation and have given us new hope to better understand the role of each of us in ministry in the church at this present time. The impactful real life lessons 
through your life ministry and you recounting the stories that you learned from the Archbishop Woodrow could not have been a better methodology to assist all of us in understanding what it is to understand and to help heal the grief. You left with us a few impactful lessons, and I would just touch on a few of those. We need to be true to self. We have to be authentic. We have to be open to change. And the church, as you said, remain central. And it was in um, the way that um, Archbishop Woodrow lived and taught the many that he church his life. We all need to remember that in ministry, you noted that there must be and we must develop the art of listening. We must be ever present if we are to assist those that need our service, those in grief, and we must be able to assess the spiritual needs of the individuals. This is indeed powerful. It is calling us to a ministry of action. I think if I were to take one lesson away this evening, it is that the church is not just a place for service, but the church is actually that link that can bring us all together to help release the grief of others. Therefore, I want to say once more our sincerest thanks to you. And I'm sure that I read somewhere that our own Bishop Friday wrote that the Archbishop, the Most Reverend Sir George Cuthbert Manning, as Bishop Woodruff, had a wonderful sense of humor. In life, we must be able to humor even our own selves. And I take the liberty of saying that if he were here with us, he would have been pleased with tonight's presentation and with you, Dr. Richard. I say thank you once more to all those who have enabled this lecture to take place. The media houses, sponsors, and all those who have contributed to this event. I humbly say thank you to one and all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ms. Anthony? Yes, thank I you. I am sure that each of our hearts are filled from your expression of thankfulness. And so, I say a heartfelt thank you for thanking us. Thank you. <laughs> At this time, we call on the Bishop, the Right Reverend C. Leopold Friday, to give the benediction. Lord be with you. Let us pray. As we come to the end of this lecture entitled Be in the Church of Hope in a Grieving World, may you go forth into the world in peace, be of good courage, hold fast that it is good, render no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint hearted support the weak, help the afflicted, honor everyone, love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop. And as we prepare to leave this virtual space, it is my hope and my belief that we will not leave the presence of the Most High. May we all seek to be an everyday blessing to the people that we encounter so that lives are changed, spirits are renewed, and hope is restored, especially in trying times like these. And so I say have a blessed night and take good care. God bless you all. Blessings. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Father Jones. Everyone did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Have a good night. Yeah. God bless. Love you all. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Love you all. Bye. Bye.